Hi, everybody. My name's Gabby. My name's Phil Whitrock. And we are both engineers from um, the Kubernetes team at Apple. And today we're really excited to talk to you about 535,600 CLIs. Um, you don't want to hear us sing the entire rent soundtrack in this talk, so we'll keep that part short. Um, but the jokes aside, we're really excited to talk about the variety of Kubernetes CLIs out there today and to help demystify the space. While many of us are familiar with kubectl, kubectl has a lot of company among Kubernetes CLIs. Whether you're getting started running your first pod or running sophisticated applications in production, there are many CLIs in the Kubernetes ecosystem that can help you describe how you run applications. Though some of these tools have become more popular than others, the number of distinct solutions continues to grow. This means that staying on top of the latest developments and the most innovative techniques is next to impossible. Sometimes looking at the landscape of Kubernetes CLIs feels like looking at everybody's favorite CNCF landscape chart. It's overwhelming and it frequently changes. And so rather than going through each uh, CLI individually and telling you what it does, really the goal of this talk is to introduce a model for making sense of that vast landscape uh, so that you can really navigate it on your own. And we're gonna identify a couple categories of problems that CLIs typically try to address and then the ways that they try to address them. So the first problem we're gonna look at is you wanna define your application in some higher level construct, construct that maps to some lower level APIs. So for example, what you wanna do is run a Golang program um, rather than saying, I wanna run this deployment service config map, et cetera. The second sort of problem we often see is you really wanna run the same construct in varying ways across environments. And the ways they vary usually are at a relatively low level. So for instance, you wanna run your Go program in staging, Canary, prod US West, prod US East, all with uh, slightly varying values. And the third problem uh, we're gonna look at is really about taking high level supplemental concerns that are loosely coupled to any specific abstraction or any specific invariant uh, and really just cut across them, right? So for instance, you wanna set up uh, logging or some sort of a sidecar container for all your applications, whether they are Golang or Spring Boot or Rails or Node.js or something else. And when you're building a production grade system, you're likely gonna to need to come overcome all of these problems, right? So for instance, you're gonna to wanna to say, I wanna run my Golang application. I wanna run it with Splunk logging and I wanna run it in staging canary in production all with slightly varying values. A firm understanding of how to select among the ecosystem CLIs, as well as combine them, can help deliver substantial outcomes. And these include architecting your first Kubernetes application all the way to building comprehensive continuous integration pipelines. And so the CLIs approach these problems in a couple of different ways. And the way a CLI uh, approaches a problem really has a big impact on um, what trade-offs it offers and how well it's able to address each one. So we're gonna go through each of the kind of high-level approaches that CLIs use to tackle these problems and show an example using a real tool. So templating is the first approach we're gonna look at. Uh, templating is a relatively simple approach for solving abstraction. You have a template that accepts some predefined set of input values, and then that produces a set of output resources. Uh, so for instance, in, in our example, you would have some Golang template that accepts some inputs and then produces a deployment service config map. All right, let's hop into our first demo. Um, we're going to deploy something a lot of people deploy to their Kubernetes clusters, which is kube state metrics exposed via Prometheus. 
The chart that YAML we have um, here is pulled from the Prometheus Project's official Helm chart repository on GitHub. So looking at this chart that YAML file, which serves as kind of the overarching um, document over this entire Helm chart, you'll notice that this file describes all of the applications that are actually going to be deployed as part of this chart, as well as metadata about version, as well as maintainers. And another um, element I want to focus on here is the fact that this is a Prometheus project, meaning that cube state metrics is actually not part of this chart itself and is pulled from another Helm chart. So we have an example of cross-cutting abstraction here. And finally, you'll notice that we have a templates directory, which includes templates for all of the YAML that will be generated as part of um, this Helm chart. With, and whose values we can actually modify using values.yaml, which just gives us a lot of um, variables for customizing what our settings are, our configurations are in this Helm chart. So let's get started then. I'm going to deploy all of these services um, through this chart to my local client cluster. So let's install this. Um, we'll name our application queue metrics. Finally, we'll pass in the directory, including our chart and all of its templates. And you can see all of the output we have here corresponding to actually um, starting all of our Prometheus and CubeState metrics deployments. And let's see if our deployments are there. And you can see um, they were all spun up and this required very little involvement from us, it was just all abstracted away and ready to use. Okay, and so uh, Gavi just demonstrated using uh, Helm with templating. Some of the great things about templating are, is a relatively simple approach. It's relatively easy to understand uh, what's going on and it's relatively mature. And, and sort of the limitations of templating are that there's really only so much you can put into the template uh, as inputs, right? So you can't um, supply every field that you want to maybe set in the low-level types. Uh, and it doesn't natively really tackle uh, variance or cross-cutting concerns. The second sort of approach we're going to look at is YAML composition. And so an example of this is customize. With YAML composition, the uh, inputs specified by the user are still in the native form of the API that the server supports. And so really it's about um, breaking up your YAML configuration files into composable pieces and factoring out either like a common thing like a namespace from a bunch of different YAML files so you can only specify it in one place or uh, factoring out some common piece of uh, configuration from a base where you can use that to apply to different variant environments. Um, in fact, you can layer customize on top of other CLIs more focused on abstraction like Helm. Using customize, you can post process Helm charts and create variants of out of the box applications. And even better, you can generate these variants instead of having to manually fork and modify your application configuration. All right, so in our last example, we briefly covered how you could customize the configuration of your Helm chart application using the values.yaml file. But what about the case where you actually want to have two different variants of these Helm charts, um, one for a staging and one for a production cluster? And just to dive into this example a little more, let's say I wanted to have different um, metrics retention dates for my different Prometheus servers deployed to staging versus production clusters. Um, so we can pull out the retention date we currently have by default by just getting the deployment and grouping out what retention is. So you can see that we have a retention argument passed to one of our containers that is for 15 days. How could I make it seven days for staging because we don't care about staging metrics retention as much, but also set it to 30 days for production clusters? Um, we can do this using customize and a concept called overlays. And what overlays do is allow you to apply 
patches to create variants of um, a base source of configuration. And in this case, we're going to use Helm as our, as our base. So you can see that in this patch here, what we do is we just provide um, enough information for a customized to know how to map this patch to a particular pod um, in deployment. So you can see that we provide the necessary matching labels and we then provide an override for the argument that we want to set to seven days in um, our staging instance. And likewise, we have a patch in our uh, production overlay that's for 30 days. So to run this, we can create a small script around the customized CLI that allows us to supply these patches uh, whenever we want. And we can invoke in this example, which patch we want to use by using a um, environment variable to say what environment we're deploying to. So we are going to set our deployment environment to staging. And then we're going to run Helm install similar to the last time. But we're going to add a new argument called post renderer. And what this does is it allows us to pass in our customized script to apply our um, desired overlay. So let's run this and apply this to our cluster. You can see we got the same output as last time, indicating that we got the expected um, deployment set up. Let's quickly go back and run and see what our retention policy looks like now. And you'll see that instead of 15 days earlier, now it's just seven days. So this overlay was uh, applied as expected to our staging cluster. Uh, thanks for the demo, Gabby. Uh, and so as we saw that a YAML composition is great for producing like a variant or uh, factoring out some piece of YAML from another piece, uh, variants or YAML composition allows multiple layers to be defined. So unlike templating, which tend to be uh, binary relationships, you can stack more and more layers on top of each other. And they do stay true to the underlying API. So you can uh, understand like how you, if you want to set a particular field, it's relatively straightforward to understand how to set that field. Really their limitations are that one, they cannot express higher level abstractions. You are operating at a low level uh, inserting snippets here and there. So if you just want to say, set this field, and then it goes and generates a bunch of different other stuff, that's not something you're going to get from YAML composition. And it can't express any sort of dynamic or reactive logic. So that means if you are patching another layer, and that layer changes underneath you, your patch is not going to be able to react to that. It's, it's just going to be sta uh, static, and so that can be brittle. Uh, sorry, can we pause for a sec? Right. I'm just gonna have to. I'm gonna have to turn on my do not disturb. There we go. Sorry, there was a little ping. It's annoying. <laughs> okay, and starting. A third approach we're gonna look at are configuration domain specific languages, and configuration DSLs are languages specifically designed for users to express. Uh, configuration and solve problems related to configuration. They're optimized for expressing and composing and uh, transforming configuration data. And they frequently use something like inheritance or unification as their primary technique. In this demo, we'll take a look at the BSL Qlang. And what Qlang does is it allows you to create this um, notion of a, a patch that's applied to um, base deployments. So let's actually take a look at this patch first. And you can see that this patch is responsible for providing default values, um, but also imposing types on certain fields that are supposed to be populated by the base values um, that I'll show you above. But you can see that replicas are meant to be integers and um, components are meant to be strings. And scrolling up here, we can see that we've actually um, been able to populate those typed values with um, the actual values of their own. 
So we have one for staging that has the seven day retention period we're now familiar with. Um, and we also have a production one with a 30 day retention day uh, period. So let's take a look at running this. And you can see that what is spat out are our deployment manifests um, with our corresponding custom retention dates. And just to show this typing in action, let's set replicas up here to a string, which it's not supposed to be. And you'll see that we Q was able to uh, give us an error related to this mismatch between types. And so summarizing domain-specific languages, they're really a one-stop shop for expressing your configuration. You can do uh, all your configuration stuff in them. They really are focused on providing a configuration first experience. Uh, and they have a slightly different uh, way of thinking than standard traditional programming, where it's really more about something like inheritance. Um, some of the you know, cons are that because they're a different model than imperative programming languages, uh, you need to learn uh, how to use that particular DSL. Uh, and you, they really need to be standardized in an organization. If you're having different sorts of DSLs in your organization and some DSLs are used for one particular type of workload and um, another DSL uh, is used for another type of workload, then that uh, can be really difficult to build up a good set of libraries. And then a tip with DSLs is because they are not uh, general purpose languages that most folks are familiar with how to debug and all, have all the debug tools that they're used to, um, you really want to avoid doing like clever things that can make the control flow hard to follow. All right, moving on to the general purpose language techniques. So this is kind of following in the idea of why don't we do configuration as code. And instead of having a, you know, kind of new thing that folks have to learn, uh, trade that sort of customized uh, model focused on configuration for a model that just uses a programming language people are familiar with. Um, it's often part of a framework which can do uh, more than just expressing configuration, but can also uh, manage stuff like rolling out your configuration or uh, solving other problems for you. And oftentimes these frameworks are capable of pulling in configuration from other sources so you can use Helm or Customize or uh, a DSL tool with them as an input source. In this example, we'll briefly cover Pulumi, which allows you to write Go that is compiled into an executable that Pulumi runs to install whatever's defined in this executable um, to an actual Kubernetes cluster. So you can see that we can provide configuration arguments, such as what destination or type of cluster we're deploying this to, and then write imperative logic to change the value of certain um, variables, depending on where we're going to be using these variables. And down here, um, you can see that the, the Prometheus server deployment that we've been using throughout our demos is now represented as a classic Go struct that makes use of the variables we set imperatively above. Um, so this quacks like Go, it looks like Go because it is Go, and that is one of the powers of Pulumi. Uh, so looking at uh, general purpose languages, the pros are their familiar uh, approach because they have reusable libraries, reusable patterns, IDs and, and debuggers folks are used to. Um, and they may come with a built-in support for uh, tackling other problems and they can usually ingest configuration from other sources as well. Um, some of the limitations of general purpose languages is that um, the languages themselves are typically not optimized for expressing configuration. Um, so it's a little more challenging than the DSL would provide. Uh, there is complexity that comes with writing a program, like the ability to just look at the program and know that this is going to output the right thing is more challenging when you have functions and you have uh, for loops and branches and these sorts of things. And that um, when they are packaged with an orchestration solution, that it may be difficult to tease the two apart and they may be tightly coupled enough that you can't just 
use the general purpose SDK with um, your arbitrary orchestration solution you're using today. And so the final approach we're going to look at is modeling client-side configuration uh, similar to server-side APIs, right, or server-side uh, really configuration. And so the idea here is you write, um, you know, modules or functions which look at the holistic state of the system, similar to how controllers look at the holistic st state of the system and are capable of uh, reading and config configuration, generating new configuration, transforming configuration, or uh, validating configuration based on uh, some desired spec provided to that function. And so like one thing you can do here that's different than has been shown so far is rather than trying to um, take a high level construct for an abstraction and generate configuration from it, you can actually take in a low level deployment and annotate that deployment to say, okay, turn this into a high level thing and then it can promote it by attaching a configuration data to a resource you've already defined. All right, time for our last demo where we're gonna be showing off KPT. Um, and KPT is different than customized and even DSLs because instead of patching a high level resource with low level settings, KPT takes an opposite approach in which it takes a low level resource and populates and promotes it into a Prometheus deployment. So in this root deployment YAML, we provide information uh, merely relating to what KPT's reconciliation of sorts um, will match on to add for more fields to a particular deployment. Um, and we use something called the Starlark script uh, to handle that in KPT land, but we won't delve into that too much in this demo. Just know when we run KPT function run um, and then try run it to get the YAML and enable star so we can run that Starlark script, you can see this deployment we have above is expanded out with um, the other fields like image arguments that we expected as in previous demos. And here we again see our default of 17 days. Now to watch KPT's variance support in action, we can uncomment the spec here, which provides a different first argument and then run the same argument as we ran previously and you'll see that the promoted deployment now includes our um, new custom retention time of just seven days. So that's just the taste of KPT in action. The uh, pros of the sort of controller-esque approach are that the architecture is similar to the Kubernetes APIs and controllers. And so you get kind of the same capabilities that you get there. Uh, if you are uh, consuming uh, functions that this is a relatively flexible and composable approach, just as controllers and APIs, you can match deployments and horizontal pod auto scalers and these sorts of things. You can do similar capabilities. Um, the, the cons are one that writing a controller, for instance, is more difficult than writing a, a template. And that's true here as well. You're, evaluating a much broader set of inputs and, and reconciling the state of the system. So it's going to be more difficult to write those modules because they are more sophisticated. And, and a second limitation here is that it is a really relatively new and experimental approach. Um, it's really only been uh, come about in the last year. And so there's not a lot of resources for what are the best practices and, and how do you best use this technology. All right, now that we've had a chance to go over five technique use, techniques used by Kubernetes CLIs, we can evaluate how each type of CLI can help us with certain objectives. So on the top two rows, templating and YAML composition emerge as the ideal option for folks who want to keep their logic simple. They are useful for abstraction and variance, respectively, but given their emphasis on simplicity, they don't attempt to provide all of abstraction, cross-cutting abstraction, and variance at once. So as a result, you might not get all that you want from either of these options. 
Moving down the y-axis, we can see that domain-specific languages and general-purpose languages offer similar functionality, with um, less simplicity traded for more customizability. The choice between the two language-based options hinges on how declarative versus imperative you want your logic to be. DSLs are also great if you invest in your configuration system and can standardize on a single approach, whereas general purpose languages are useful if you want to develop solutions in a language you're already familiar with or want to ingest multiple input types into an orchestration system with some last mile changes. And finally, our relative newcomer, controller-esque CLIs, allows you to layer and combine logic. So for folks looking to mix and match logic on various types of inputs, as well as try something kind of fun and new, um, controller-esque CLIs might be a good fit for you. On that note, we hope this talk successfully opened you up to something you didn't know and empowered you to explore the diverse world of Kubernetes CLIs out there. Thank you for your time. Now we're going to take questions, right? Yes, question yeah. time. <laughs>